Welcome, church. Oh, sorry about that. I had a few things to take care of upstairs. How's everybody doing? Good. I got this chance to spend some time with most of you, but not everyone. Miss Janet, welcome to Families of Faith. Welcome to Midweek Connections. We're glad to have you here. For those of you who don't know, Miss Janet is our new friend. This is her first time coming here, and she's here with Miss Shirley, so make sure you get to meet her afterwards. Amen? Amen. Now, church, before we get started today, I want to talk to you this morning about something that will hopefully open your hearts and your minds to receive what God has for us. Now, most of you know that I have what is called TBI, right? That's brain damage. The VA says that my brain operates at the same capacity as a senior citizen with early stages of Alzheimer's. Although my parents tried, I was never raised in the church. I never went to college, and I certainly didn't go to seminary school. On top of that, I don't get paid to be here, and I'm not even a pastor. And if anything, individually, almost every one of you has more time being a disciple than I do, right? Some of you have been following the Lord before I was even born. And despite being a broken, uneducated foreigner to the ways of God, here we are week after week, month after month, year after year. And this is not to brag or boast about anything that I am doing. I mean, I just told you, by all world standards, I'm not the guy. But we know that God doesn't operate with world standards, does he? No, he doesn't. So no, I'm not boasting about myself in any way. But what, I'm, what I am saying, what I'm saying to you is listen up. Listen to what God is telling us here, church. Because nothing, and I strongly say nothing that we have learned here at Midweek has ever come from my knowledge. And if someone like me can stand here and speak the truths of God's word, then I would say, listen up. Because this is as close as you are going to get in life to hearing a donkey speak, per se. Right? In world standards, that's what I am. Right? Broken, uneducated, never been to seminary school. That's world standards. I know that's not your standards and that's not God's standards. I hear you all saying no. But that's the world standards. Now, last week... We had a small recap of everything that Jesus has taught us chronologically so far, right? Miss Janet, in the last seven months, we've been looking at Christ's life in a chronological order. And it's helped paint a bigger picture into, and a clearer picture into the things that we see happening later on. So in the last seven months, we have seen three clear teachings. Remember, the first and foremost clearest teaching we have seen is Jesus's complete obedience to God in the way that he conducted himself. Second thing we've seen is almost likened to the first. And that's what we've seen is Jesus' love and compassion for all of mankind. And the third thing that we've clearly seen is Jesus' intolerance for the hypocrisy of religion. Right? And because of this, not everybody's welcoming Jesus. Last week, we left off with the immoral, sinful woman that was weeping and kissing the feet of Jesus as Simon the Pharisee was trying to discredit Jesus. And we clearly saw Jesus showing us that a love or a zeal for God that stems from the midst of religion is not sufficient and capable at all. Yes, love does cover a multitude of sins. But it's not our love that does so. It's Christ's love and His compassion that makes that possible. Now today for us in the life of Christ, we are going to be exploring a testimony of Jesus that is titled in the Bible, Jesus and the Prince of Demons. And you can see that this testimony is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's in Matthew's testimony where we're going to be starting today. In verses 23 through 37, we find in Matthew 12. Then 
a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. He healed the man so that he could both speak and see. The crowd was amazed, and they asked, Could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? But when the Pharisees heard about this miracle, they said, No wonder he can cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Now Jesus knew their thoughts and replied, A kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he is dividing and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. And if I am empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will be condemned for what you have said. But I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter a strong man, a strong man and plunder his good? Only someone who's even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and plunder his house. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or the world to come. A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruits will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruits will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from a treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give account on Judgment Day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Church, remember out of all the things that Jesus did this day, This is the one testimony that God decided was necessary to leave us so that he could teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. Is that not true? That's what the word of God says. God wants to correct us when we are wrong and teach us what to do is what to do. That's right. God uses his word to prepare and equip his people to do every good work, right? So listen once again to what Jesus and God is telling us here in verse 22 and 23. Then a demon-possessed man who was blind and couldn't speak was brought to Jesus. He healed the man so that he could both speak and see. And then the crowd was amazed. And they asked, Could it be that Jesus is the son of David, the Messiah? Listen, this testimony so far because of Christ is off to a pretty pretty good start, wouldn't you say? I mean, Jesus just healed a demon-possessed man. Another miracle that he has done that is causing the people and the crowds to be amazed and to ask themselves, could it be that Jesus is the Son of David, the Messiah, I mean, what another beautiful moment this must have been to be there and witness. A miracle is performed. A man that was blind and mute can now see and talk. And the people are starting to wonder, could it be that Jesus is the Messiah? And once again, here comes religion, right? 
In verse 24, we find, But when the Pharisees heard about the miracle, they said, No wonder he cast out demons. He gets his power from Satan, the prince of demons. Church, do you see, instead of acknowledging God and the true source of this miracle, the religious leaders accused Jesus of casting out demons through the power of Satan? Church, do you see the depths to which religious hypocrisy can sink? Listen, this is not a simple under misunderstanding of doctrine, is it? No, it's not. This accusation is a deliberate and malicious attempt not only to undermine Jesus' authority, but to also tarnish his name by contributing this miracle to an act of Satan. That's why Jesus replies in verse 25 and following, Jesus knew their thoughts and replied, A kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he is dividing and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. And if I'm empowered by Satan, what about your own exorcists? They cast out demons too, so they will be condemned for what you have said. But if I am casting out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has already arrived among you. For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger. Someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Listen, church, you don't fight with yourself to breathe, do you? Does anybody here fight with themselves to breathe? Are there times in your life where you say, I don't want to breathe? And unfortunately, as much as I try to hold my breath, my lungs just naturally grasp for air. Anybody try doing that? No, of course not. That would be absolutely foolish. And so it is here. Why would Satan try to destroy himself? If he did that, his own kingdom would not survive. Jesus is clearly telling us that no, he is not from Satan. And such claims cannot even be plausible. Such theory cannot stand because it's physically impossible. I mean, that's the simple binary nature of life, is it not? If one side of the coin is not aligned with Satan, then by logical deduction, it must be aligned with God. This reinforces the teachings that we've been hearing all along. That there are only two definitive options in life. There's right and there's wrong. There's good and there's evil. There's the narrow road and the broad road. There's heaven or hell. There's God or Satan. There is no middle ground where you can find yourself. You're either on one side or the other. And there are no alternative explanations to this miracle that we just seen. This is it, church. This is it. One or the other. No middle ground. So with all sober thinking, ask yourself, whose side are you on? Listen, I told you last week, at this point in our lives, chronologically speaking, for the last seven months, we are either one of two people. We are either disciples of Christ or we are still following him around trying to figure out who is this man. Could it be that this Jesus is the son of David? Could it be he's the Messiah? Right? That's one of two people. That's who we are at this point. Listen, church, as Jesus goes on in verse 30, he tells us, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Church, up to this point in our lives, it's clearly evident that the blind receive sight, that the lame walk, that those who have leprosy are cleansed, 
The deaf hear and the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Right? Is that not evident? We've seen that in Jesus' life so far. And we've seen that in our personal lives that we've had with Jesus so far. Have we not? And here, right before the Pharisees' own eyes, they too seen this. They seen this demon-possessed man healed by Jesus himself. Yet because of their own mere human concerns, and because of their own hardening of their hearts, we find that the religious leaders were actually opposing Jesus and working against him. You know that term, hardening of the heart? That could be kind of one of those misunderstood sayings if you've never heard it before. Listen, you might be the sweetest, kindest, most gentle person there is, and at the same time, have a heart that is completely calloused to the truths of God. And the way one's heart becomes hardened and calloused is by hearing the truth and choosing not to respond to it. Choosing to blatantly disregard it and turn your back on it. I mean, that's the heart of the hypocrites that Jesus has been warning us about. Remember those interpreters from underneath that we heard about? Listen, church, we can play religion all day long. We can dress up, slap some crosses on our necks, and go out on the street corners for everyone to see us. But that's not the way Jesus told us to do it, is it? Anyone who isn't with Jesus opposes him. And anyone who isn't working with Jesus is actually working against him. Listen, church, believe it or not, we do need to make a choice on who we stand with. And I'm not talking about making a stand for your salvation. The real question you need to ask yourself is, am I standing with God and the teachings of His Son, Jesus Christ? Or are you with man, this world, your mere human concerns, or whatever strings that Satan might be using to tug on the heart of man? Church, in these final years that we have left, more than ever, we have to stand on the truth of God and nothing else. I mean, did we just not see? The crowd was amazed and asked, could it be that Jesus is the Messiah? And religion says, no, that's just Satan casting out Satan. Now in verses 31 and following, we find Jesus telling us, I tell you that every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. Church, we know already that a tree is identified by its fruit. And if a tree is good, it will produce good fruit. And if a tree is bad, it will produce bad fruit. Jesus says to them, not to us, you brood of snakes. How could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on Judgment Day for every idle word you speak. Because the words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Now, for most of us, we associate the word blasphemy with such sins as cursing God and using His name in vain. We also associate blasphemy with degrading things related to God, right? Spray painting churches, destroying crosses, things like that. Or any other sort of defacing vandalism. However, in this particular case of blasphemy, this is not what Jesus is referring to. 
Here he specifically says, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except for blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Church, just listen. Just listen to religion here. The Pharisees have seen with their own eyes irrefutable proof that Jesus had healed this demon-possessed man. And that He did so with the power of the Holy Spirit. And right away, they say Jesus Himself is under the authority of Satan. Now to get a better understanding of all this, we need to go into Mark and Luke's account and see what they have to say. Now in the beginning of Mark's testimony, in, verse, in Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, we find that... Sorry, I don't have my screen on up here. That's why I keep looking back. Anyways, we find that Jesus entered a house and again a co- crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Now listen to this. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. We then find Mark concluding this testimony in verses 28 to 35. And he records Jesus saying, thank you, brother. He turned the TV on for me. He recorded Jesus saying, truly, I tell you. People can be forgiven of all their sins and slander they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. Now Jesus said this because they were saying he was an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brother arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brother are outside looking for you. But he asked, Who are my brother? Or who is my mother and who are my brothers? Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here, here are my mother and here are my brothers. Whoever does does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, in Luke's account, he ends the same testimony with when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places, seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to that house I left. When it arrives, it finds that the house was swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. As Jesus was saying, now listen to this, listen. As Jesus was saying these things, right? That means he's speaking and somebody started to interrupt him. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave birth and nursed you. But Jesus replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Amen? Amen. Now, church, when we take all that we heard, and this is a lot, and I've told you many times, this is not the definitive answer on what God has to tell us here. If anything, this is the menu or the appetizer for you to get a little nibble on and get a taste of and see that God is good and go home and explore this yourself. Amen? Amen. So now... When we look at all three accounts, we can clearly see that Jesus is warning us about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, right? This goes beyond the conventional notions of what we know as blasphemy. Unlike the more familiar forms of cursing God, this particular form of blasphemy is distinct, is it not? I mean, Jesus clearly tells us Every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except for this one. And as we tie this into Mark and Luke's account, we find that the context of this warning becomes clearer as it directs our attention, it should direct our attention, to the critical dangers 
of ungodly rebellion. Listen, church, church, so far we have clearly seen Jesus and his intolerance for the hypocrisy of religion. And it's quite evident that these Pharisees were bad guys, right? Doing bad things. They were people who were not working with Jesus, but instead actually working against him. Listen, in case you didn't know this, Pharisees were not part of some pagan religion. That means they didn't worship stars and suns and moons and rocks and all kinds of man-made things. The Pharisees were Jewish people that worshipped God. And I'm going to say worshipped God very smallly. Amen. They were Jewish people that worshipped God. And much of what they taught actually aligned with the principles of what Jesus teaches us. In fact, later on, we're going to hear Jesus telling us, so you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. And this is important for us to know, because when Jesus speaks about the hypocrisy towards religion, he's not talking about the religion of false gods and man-made things. He's talking about the hypocrisy that comes from the heart and heart of his own people. In fact, the clue to all this is in the name Pharisee alone. Pharisee literally means one who is separated. And in their case, they were one who is separated from God. Now between the Pharisees' actions and the actions of Jesus' own family that claimed that he was out of his mind, we can see the distinction between blasphemy that can be forgiven and blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. In the case of Jesus' family, that was blasphemy against Jesus. And as wrong as they were, all they simply said was, he's out of his mind. But the accusation that the Pharisees here said did not stem from a mere misunderstanding of God, Scripture, or even who Jesus is. Jesus is the truth, and the truth was right there in front of them, doing things that they knew came from the Holy Spirit, and they chose to deliberately reject Jesus, and not only reject Him, but worse than that, they maliciously attributed the miracle that Jesus just performed to the demonic works of Satan. Listen, the truths of these two distinctions can be found in the response that Jesus gives to his family and to the Pharisees. Once again, to the Pharisees, we find Jesus calling them a brood of snakes or a brood of vipers, right? Remember that? We talked about that before. That's a bunch of baby vipers that bite at anything they see. They don't even know what they're doing. They, right? That's what they do. But to his family, to his family, Jesus' response was, Who are my mother and my brothers? Who are they? Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So church, once again, we find ourselves with only two options here. And we really need to ask ourselves, am I living in God's will for my life? Not are you living in God's salvation. I don't question any of your salvation, right? No. But are you living in His will? Are you living the life that He has planned for you? Doing the works that He created you to do in Christ Jesus? Or are you living the life you have planned for yourself? Listen, I have told you, I have told you personally, this life, this life, this life, what you know of me, this life is not my will. 
It's not my will. I've shared with you my will. My will is to be out in the deserts of Arizona, right? I laugh at it. Laugh at it. I laugh at it too. That's my will. This is not my will. Not at all. Not any of this is my will. All that I have today, everything that I have today, is because of living in God's will. By being obedient to what He says and nothing else. As we heard Jesus tell us last week, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Listen, Jesus' family was part of that everyone that put their faith into practice, right? And in this moment, they just happened to make the wrong choice by saying he's out of his mind. But the Pharisees, they openly blasphemed against the Holy Spirit, against God and everything that he was doing by saying Jesus was empowered by Satan. Both being sin, yes, his family and the Pharisees, but one being forgivable and one being not. Now both these testimonies clearly show us the dangers of rebelling against God. And it's in Luke's account where we heard the depth to the consequences of our rebellion. The image of that impure spirit leaving a person and then returning with seven more wicked spirits illustrates to us the perilous state of those who reject the truth. Saved or not, we can all be in danger of messing up that clean house that Jesus has swept out himself. So church, as we start to close today, this testimony of Jesus that God has given to us today should serve as a reminder that we need to stop. We need to stop and consider the implications for our own lives and our religious practices. Are our lives like the religious leaders of Jesus' time? that got so hell-bent on their own agenda that it drove them not only to deny Christ, but to blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? Do we in our religious fervor inadvertently contribute to a kingdom divided against itself? Listen, our journey with Jesus so far has shown us the importance of genuine faith rooted in obedience, love, and in, in a sincere desire to follow God's will for our lives. Amen, brother. Truth is, church, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Religious practices, religious laws, and flat-out religion itself can become a hindrance to our one true commitment to God. I think I told you all about the conversation with the man I had in Arizona. The man I had a conversation with about Jesus. Remember, he told me that he believed Jesus as the one Son of God that died on the cross for all of mankind's sin, which sounded pretty good so far, right? I mean, that's a pretty good start. But then when we started talking about actual Scripture... What God has to say, not what we think or what we heard. The man sat there and he was dumbfounded. And when he asked me how I knew so much, I said it's because I read my Bible and I study my Bible. And that's when this man said, they, meaning the congregation in his church, they don't read their Bibles. Because in his faith, the church has the final say-so in the matter. So I asked him, what does that even mean, right? What does that mean? And he said, well, if the Bible goes against one of the teachings of the church, then the Bible is not applicable in that situation. Yeah, you think that's bad? You think that's bad? Listen, I know Christians. I know Christians that will sit there and argue with you 
and tell you that the only authorized word of God is the King James Bible. And that anything else, especially the NIV, is actually inspired works of Satan. I've heard people say that. Really? The only authorized version is this? And everything else is inspired by Satan? I mean, I'm pretty sure that's the same problem that we just heard with these Pharisees, is it not? These Bibles are not from God. These are works of Satan. Jesus can only do miracles because of the power of Satan. Seriously, people. Seriously? I want to show just one example. I want to show one example of Scripture. It's in Proverbs eleven fifteen. He that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it, and he that hateth suretyship is sure. Now, that same verse in the NIV tells us, whoever puts up security for a stranger will surely suffer, but whoever refuses to shake hands and pledge is safe. Now, just to finalize this matter, this matter, for those who say, don't you realize that, you know, other translation have taken verses out? Don't you know that the NIV has removed verses that the King James Bible has? And yes, I am aware of that. I am aware of that. And I would say I'm more aware that the person usually asking me that question is only asking with the simple knowledge of what they heard someone else tell them. Amen, brother. My point is, though, my point is, just look just look at how religion is absolutely awful in the hands of mere human concerns. Listen, personally, myself, I use the NLT, the NIV, the King James Bible, and actually the Tinsdale Bible, which was written much before the King James. I use many translations. And in no way, shape, or form am I against the King James Bible in any way. But there's no way I'm going to give that Bible to my children and tell them here learn about God, right? They just wouldn't understand it. Listen, for myself, for myself, I had to go on Google and try to figure out how to pronounce these words. I don't know these words. I never heard them before. Surety, hateth, suretyship. And then I had to figure out what do they actually mean, right? I don't know what they mean. So what do they mean? Listen, like I said, I'm not against the King James Bible in any way, shape, or form. Not at all. But what I am against is those who are more interested in telling others that this is the only authorized word of God and everything else, especially these modern-day translations, are inspired by Satan himself. I mean, just imagine, just imagine a little kid picking up a Bible and reading it and understanding it. And then you come along and tell that little child what you're reading comes straight from hell. What do you think that would do to one of these little ones? Listen, the crowd was amazed and they asked, could this be Jesus, the son of David, the Messiah that we've been searching for? But instead... Instead of acknowledging God and the true source of this miracle that we've seen today, the religious leaders accused Jesus of casting out demons through the power of Satan. Church, that's the depths of religious hypocrisy. That's how far it can sink. Listen, just as Jesus unmasked the hypocrisy of religious leaders during his time, so too, we must examine our own hearts and our motives, right? Because it's not about them. It's about us. We need to ensure that our true religion is not tainted by pride, arrogance, or a desire for power or anything else. And when I say our true religion, I'm not talking about our Baptist foundations I'm talking about what Jesus says. True religion that his father finds worthy is taking care of widows and orphans, right? And a widow and an orphan are those who are lost because any 
anybody without a father is an orphan. And anybody that is not in Christ does not have God as their father. So therefore, they are an orphan. And anybody that is not the bridegroom of Christ is a widow because they have no husband. And that's who we're supposed to take care of. The lost, the widows, and the orphans. Listen, this testimony that we just heard today teaches us that religious practices, when divorced from a true relationship with God, will become an instrument of evil. As Jesus already told us, anyone who isn't with him opposes him. And anyone who isn't working with Jesus is actually working against him. There are only two options in life. Two. That means there are only one of two things people can see in us. And remember, whether you like it or not, whether you realize it or not, people are watching you. We know this to be true because we heard Jesus already tell us we are the light of this world. So church, ask yourselves, in every moment of your life, every moment, this is not about salvation. I've told you many times, even in the prayer, I thank God for salvation, but it's not the most important thing to me. Yes, it's great that I'm saved and I have a home in heaven, but God has left us here for a reason, to do His good works while we're here on earth. Amen. So, church, ask yourselves, when you're out in this world and you're about doing the things you have to do, is this lost and dying world going to see Jesus in the way you treat them? Or is it going to be Satan that they see? Because in this world, there is nothing else in between. So, church, let us strive for authenticity in our faith. An authenticity that comes from a true relationship with God and nothing else. And if we do so, if we do so, we could actually avoid these pitfalls of religious hypocrisy. And we could be the salt of the earth and the light of this world that God has called us to be. Amen? Amen, church. God's got a plan for our lives. If you still have breath, you still have purpose. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be anything other than who God called you to be. You know that? Church, a lot of things are changing. I don't want to get off the message, but I love you. I love you very much, all of you. You are all such an inspiration to me and my future to know that no matter what, you pushed through this far and you're still here. Amen? And I only hope through faith, not through the life that God allows me to live, but through my faith with Him, one day I could say I've been following Christ just as long as you all have been. And you're going to be the example that helps me get that way. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father God, I thank You again, Lord. Yes, Father, thank You for the salvation You give us. But let us not look at that as the most important thing that matters. The most important thing that matters is the salvation that awaits for those that are lost. And Father, we are the salt of this earth. We are the light of this world. We are everything that you've told us we are. So help us to believe that, Lord. Help us to believe it. Help us to encourage each other and lift each other up when we feel down and inspire each other to stand back up and say one more time, I'm going to give it one more shot. This is all we got left. Our lives are almost over, Lord. We're on the way out. And all you ask is for our obedience. Thank you, Lord, for your word that teaches us when we're wrong and guides us to where we need to be. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit that does things for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Thank you, Father, for your unfailing love, your mercy and your grace that we do not deserve. Give us the opportunities, Father, to be the example you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, I'll see you guys all on the other side. I'll be out there in a